good morning or good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world right now. Today, we're going to spend a few minutes and talk about public cloud and how it's a lot like dinner. Now, everybody loves a good dinner. Everybody's having a great time. Even the little girl in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is drinking a beer. It's just a good time for all. And I know when I was a kid, we didn't have a whole lot, but the matriarch of the family, my mom, made sure that we all went out as a family every once in a while to a really good dinner. The problem is every, every family has an Uncle Phil. Good old drunk Uncle Phil would wander in, pull over the sommelier, and start ordering wine. Now, he wasn't necessarily the smartest guy when it came to wine, so he didn't necessarily like it every single time. Maybe he didn't finish the bottle, and sometimes it was a pretty expensive bottle of wine. What that led to was when the check came, little bit of sticker shock. So one of the things that my mom realized is that you had to understand the people who were at dinner, and you had to put some guardrails and some policies on what we could do at dinner. And I'm sure we've all experienced something like this, like say at a sales kickoff or a, uh, something like that, where you go to the bar and there are three pre-selected bottles of wine, all decent wine, all within a pretty good price range. Well, that's the type of policies we want to set up for cloud. Now, it's not wine policies, it's cloud policies, but the similarities exist. So let me go ahead and just show you that in my instance. Now, in this instance, we're looking at the dashboard. This dashboard starts with the cloud spend and analytics, and we could just kind of just highlight that in the last 30 days, we spent about two grand, which is interesting to know, but let's start drilling into some of the details behind it. Starting with this cloud spend. Cloud spend gives us this dashboard that says in that 2,800 that we just spent, 45% of it's on compute, 35% of it's on storage, 10% on database, you get the picture. Great way to take a look and say, hey, it looks like we're spending a lot on databases or something else we could do, remix this, that kind of thing. Gives you that ability to then forecast it as well. On the optimization side, however, this is gonna be a result of our policies. Let's start right here on the unused machines. We're saying that unused, I'm going to save $9,703 by spinning down unused machines. Now, these are machines, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Uncle Phil, these are machines that uh, he ordered and never, never actually uh, drank any of that wine. You know, similarly to by right-sizing. Right-sizing is the other side of the coin for the uh, unused machines. Right-sizing is saying that he ordered that wine, but he didn't drink the whole bottle. Maybe next time we want to say, okay, only order a glass, whatever the case may be. Right. And then, of course, the business hours. And this is another guardrail that we could set up. It says, hey, you know what? This server that you spun up, it's a, it's a test server. And the testing team, the QA team, is only in between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So, you know, at 10 a, at p.m., it doesn't have to be running anymore. Let's shut it down. Here's what's really cool about all that. We can start getting a look at the details of that, too. So if I jump into my right sizing, for example, the details of it here are going to point out this machine, for example, is currently at a M5.4 large. We want to drop it to a C5.2 large. It's going to save about $200 a month. We can do the same thing with unused machines. We also know who owns these machines. We could say this configuration item, I'm going to save $73 a month by spinning it down. And right now that's going to be affecting this organization here. So we should probably go talk to them. Here's where I look at the business hours. These are machines that may be running out of business hours. What determined business hours based upon the policy, right? With well, this particular machine can save $34 a month. All these different things add up to the uh, pretty significant savings. Now, What's super interesting about this is this is sitting on top of the workflow that you've already got in your IT Service Management Pro subscription. The implication here is you haven't got to invest in yet another technology, spin up yet another team of people, go through yet another training. You can leverage the investment you've made in ServiceNow technology to write workflow, to integrate with uh, anything else in the platform, uh, but also, it implies that when I do this change, I'm integrating your existing change process. So I've said that this machine can only run during certain business hours. That is implemented by opening a change. And because I know who's associated with this machine, I've got the ability to send that change through the proper routing, put it in front of the change advisory board. They say yay or nay. And I can even run workflow to automate shutting it down. Right? So. Jumping back over to my presentation, that's a quick demo of what Cloud Insights does. Now, let me give you a little bit more context. 
Cloud Insights in and of itself is a great tool but it sits inside a greater context of an IT asset management lifecycle. And you've heard me talk about this before. Starts with the request bubble. That request is something that you currently own in your IT service management pro subscription. That's your service portal. Fulfillment step is something you currently own uh, in your IT service management pro. Uh, the deploy step, you can even automate deployment using your integration hub. Uh, the monitor step is going to be what you're currently familiar with, with uh, ServiceNow Software Asset Management Professional and ServiceNow Hardware Asset Management Professional. In this case, for cloud, that's going to be your cloud insight step. Service and retire are classic features of the IT Service Management Pro. Uh, so the idea here is that Uncle Phil comes in and starts here at the deploy stage, sits right down at the table, goes over, pulls the Mater D over and the sommelier over, and orders a bottle of wine. Or in this case, Uncle Phil opens up his Amazon console and starts spinning up machines for himself. What we want to do is have Uncle Phil start here at the request stage and end at the retire stage, going through the full life cycle. Well, what does that look like? Let me jump over back to my instance and I'm going to show you. This has been the experience of the manage step. What I want to point out is I'm logged in here as a system administrator. It's a tech rat guy who wants to come in and manage stuff. No problem. But I want to give Uncle Phil his own experience. So I'm logged in as Uncle Phil here now on the service request portal. Well, this looks really familiar to you guys, right? So you already understand this. I click on request something. I then say I want a new QA server from Amazon. And I have a limited menu of what I can order from. In this case, I can just pick one of these objects. You already know what happens next. I can order it. And then I, I get asked specific questions. What's it for? How big do you need it? How long do you need it? And that's the guardrails we can kind of put around this thing. So Uncle Phil knows that we're paying attention. Once I check out, it goes through the normal fulfillment process. I've just handled request. It's now in the fulfill. We can even put workflow together to automate the deploy. The idea behind this is, is we've got those guardrails for Uncle Phil now. And this is something that you can leverage what you currently own. So hopefully you had a good time having a little bit of a conversation about dinner. Hopefully it made you hungry. Uh, maybe you're even start thinking about having a, a quick glass of wine. Not a problem. Uh, but in this case, what your next steps are, reach out to your ServiceNow sales representative, figure out a way to get this on your next contract.